Good morning, sailors. I'm Captain Tom Tercy from the Maryland School of Sailing and Seamanship. And I'd like to talk to you today about storm avoidance at sea. And for this, I'll use case studies of five of our ocean training cruises where we did encounter storms and the things that we did to deal with them. So enjoy. It's a subject that um, is near and dear to the hearts of ocean sailors. How do you avoid storms? This is um, on a parallel with how do you avoid ships in the ocean. And uh, these are two of the uh, bigger concerns that we have when we're doing um, long distance ocean sailing. And over the years, we have experienced a number of encounters with storms. And what I've done for this webinar is selected five of those to uh, discuss with you in a little bit of detail in order to give you some idea of some of the decisions that we had to make, how we went about making those decisions, and what are some of the lessons that might be learned from this. So um, before going into the specific cases, what I'd like to do is give a little bit of a background on uh, some general concepts of uh, weather at sea and um, uh, some of the um, the frequency of, of storms at sea. And here's a couple of ideas, and, and some of these are related to one another, and some of them are kind of independent thoughts. But basically, um, whatever the weather is at present, it's going to change. And that is if you're sailing in a beautiful sunny day, 12 knots, balmy, balmy breeze is blowing, uh, you can rest assured that that will change, that it won't continue that way. By the same token, if it's blowing like stink, raining, uh, big waves, you're cold, you're shivering, everybody's hungry, um, and you're, you're really hunkered down, that also will change. Uh, the storm will pass, and the sun will come out, and the balmy breezes will blow again. Uh, the next concept, rarely will all the lights stay green. And the point of that is that if you're going to sail long distance, if you're sailing a short distance, you're going out for a day sail today, you can pretty much see what the weather is going to be for the rest of the day and go sailing. But if you're going to sail more than a couple of days offshore, far from land, and you want to go from point A to point B, you can also rest assured that it's not going to, the weather is not going to stay as it is. If all the lights are green for this trip right now, you can, you can pretty well bet that some of those green lights are going to go out before you get to your destination. And therefore, calculated risks are a way, of life, a way of life at sea. And the point there is that you'll see in some of the case studies that I show you that we had to take some calculated risks and um, if you do the calculations right and you're realistic in your calculations, uh, things come out okay in the end. Uh, but of course, you can can miscalculate at any time. But also, don't presume that your preferred answer is correct. And by by that, I mean um, you want the lights to be green, you want the weather to be good, uh, you you don't want to be near a lee shore, you you do want the wind to be blowing from the right direction. And all of this may go wrong. And you therefore have to have some options in case you are wrong in your estimations. So just some general thoughts about weather philosophies at sea. Um, weather windows. We often talk about weather windows. And I've listed here major windows and minor windows. And by major windows, I mean the season and location that you sail um, and the planning that you do in order to determine those seasons and locations. And what I generally do is use the um, ocean pilot charts, and I'll show you an example of one of those in a minute here, to do that planning and to select what season you want to sail in and what location of the world you want to sail in. Like, do you want to sail in the Southern Ocean or do you want to sail in maybe the Caribbean um, or the Mediterranean or what have you? Jimmy Cornell's World Cruising Routes was a very excellent summary of uh, some surveys that he did worldwide. He went and traveled around to various sailing ports 
where boats come in, sailboats come in and out of. And he interviewed the um, the crews of those boats in order to get an idea of where they were going, why they chose this time of the year to sail, why they chose this route, and so forth. And from this, he assembled quite an extensive summary of the routes that people normally sail. And you can rest assured that most people are going to choose their routes and their time of year based on the likelihood of good weather. People are not usually, unless you're a racer, choosing bad weather to sail in. So from this, he assembled world cruising routes, and it's an excellent study of uh, where people sail and when they sail. For example, if you're going to sail from the U.S. East Coast down to the Caribbean, well, the time that most people do that trip is in the fall, actually in November, actually in the first two weeks of November, um, which is the, the weather notch between the hurricane season and the coming of the winter gales that begin to blow later on in the season. So you do want to select when and where you'd like to sail, and that that constitutes what I call major weather windows. Now, my, minor weather, weather windows deal with today, deal with this week, deal with this cruise. Um, uh, so they're short-term considerations. Should we leave today or tomorrow? What weather's coming? Should we leave a day early? Should we leave two days later? And you'll see some of this also play out in the case studies that I'm going to show you. This is an example of an uh, ocean pilot chart. And you see up the top of this, it says North Atlantic Ocean. And you can hardly see it on the right, but it says June. This is for the month of June. So there's a chart like this for every ocean of the world for every month of the year. So these charts are statistical summaries, historical summaries of uh, weather conditions. There's a um, series of narratives here on the left that describe different conditions, um, the storm conditions and the magnetic variation and the wind conditions and so forth. And um, within this chart, and this is the Atlantic Basin. Here's the coast of Africa on the right. Here's the coast of the U.S. and Canada on the left. And you see a lot of different lines here. So let me go on to a, a close-up of this chart. And within this chart, you see various things. And each of these rectangles is a five-degree rectangle, five longitude and five latitude. Uh, and for each of these rectangles, in the center of it is a wind, uh, wind rose. And the little number in the middle of that wind rose signifies the percentage of time in which there are calms. There's no wind blowing. The length of the arrows on here represent the duration of the wind blowing from that direction. So the length is the duration from that direction. So for this particular box that I'm showing here, you see that the dominant wind is from the southwest and the south, and there's still some significant wind from the southeast, but it starts to mitigate from the east and the west, and from the north, it's much, much less. So that's the duration or the percentage, of, that's the distribution basically, not the duration. The distribution of wind um, for, that time, for that time of year, for that month. The feathers on those arrows signify the wind strength. So this would signify here from the east 20 knots. Also on here, the green arrows are the, are the currents, the water currents. You may be able to see little numbers here like 0 0.5. That means 0 0.5 knots. 2.2, because here's the Gulf Stream. So the Gulf Stream is actually part of the major uh, oceanographic gyre, the circulation of water within the Atlantic Basin. And the Gulf Stream is part of that gyre. And the arrows show the direction and strength of those. The, the lines that are going from northwest to southeast are lines of magnetic variation. Uh, your compass is going to, since you're covering a large distance, your compass is going to continue to change uh, magnetic variation um, 
readings as you proceed in any direction. And this tells you roughly what the uh, magnetic variation is, and you're able to correct your, um, your compass reading to true. There's a lot of other information on here as well, but this is the place you start your planning as well as Jimmy Cornell's world cruising routes. Um, here's a summary of storm data for the North Atlantic, and this is extracted from the pilot charts. I took a series of pilot charts for different months of the year and extracted information from those and kind of averaged it out for each month. And you see that for these months shown, April through November, the number of tropical cyclones on average in April is zero, and it increases as you get to a, to a maximum of five in September. In other words, five tropical, uh, tropical cyclones occurring in the month of September on average in that part of the world. And the number of many of those convert or, or intensify to hurricanes and this next column shows the number of hurricanes on average, uh, again, for the, for the uh, North Atlantic. And then the Gale reports, these are based on the non-tropical weather systems that come blowing through um, uh, the area. And these you see uh, decreasing as the summer months come on average, and then increasing as the fall and winter approaches. So this kind of data helps you do some planning as to when you want to sail. You can do this for any ocean um, and any time of year, uh, extracted from the pilot charts. Uh, here's a hurricane, and you see the, uh, the eye in the center of that hurricane. You see the counterclockwise rotation of the wind and the uh, and the moisture, and this is in the northern hemisphere. The hurricanes will and and tropical cyclones of all uh, intensities will circulate counterclockwise. In the southern hemisphere, they're going to rotate in the opposite direction. Some hurricane basics: uh, they're intense and very destructive low pressure systems. In the North Atlantic, they usually develop along the Intertropical Convergence Zone, ITCZ, um, as it moves north during late summer. Now, what the ITCZ is, is it's the, it's the boundary between the northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere weather systems. And where those two meet is an area of great weather instability, a lot of um, moisture, a lot of very warm air, rising clouds, cumulus clouds, and so forth. And that very instable area is, is prime, as a prime area for the development of, of hurricanes. As it moves north away from the equator in summertime, those um, vertical uh, movements of air and moisture then are imparted with uh, an effect of the um, of the spin of the Earth, and um, this causes the um, them to start spinning and become uh, circular storms. Now, sometimes storms develop outside of the tropic, and again, in the examples I'll show you, you'll see a number of these. Wind speeds can be up to 150 miles an hour, and sometimes greater. And one of the things we want to do is avoid, if possible, crossing the forecast track of a hurricane. And you'll see some examples of this as well. And also, we want to avoid the so-called dangerous semicircle side. And the dangerous semicircle in the northern hemisphere is on the right side of the track. So if the, tra if the uh, storm is moving to the northeast, then the right side or the southeastern side would be the dangerous side. And the western side would be less intense. And the reason for that is that the speed of advance of the storm itself, like if the storm is moving along at, say, 15 knots, that 15 knots is going to add to the wind speed on the right side and subtract from the wind speed on the left side. And you'll see examples of this. So 
hurricane track avo avoidance again in the northern hemisphere, this little diagram shows the uh, concept of a storm moving to the northeast. The winds are rotating counterclockwise and inward as you go around the circle. And if you are to the right of the track where this little red boat is here, and you want to avoid the storm, which I assume you do, uh, you want to put the wind on your starboard bow. So you can see from this diagram that if the wind here is blowing in this direction and you are here, if you have the wind on your starboard bow, you're going to be sailing away from the storm track. If you're on the left side of the track, you want to put the wind on your starboard quarter, as shown in this diagram, and you'll be sailing away from the storm track. And um, how do you know if you're on the right or left side? Well, there's a couple of techniques there. The first I'm going to talk about is the cone of avoidance. And um, shown here, two basic options. One, if you have access to Internet images, the cone of avoidance is actually shown on the predicted track image that NOAA publishes. So in this case, here's the storm here um, in northern Florida, and you can see the forecast track and this cone that they've drawn around this track, and that's the, the cone that you want to avoid. You want to maneuver your boat to stay out of that cone. If you don't have Internet images and you have only the voice forecast over single sideband radio or the nav text, uh, the predicted track is given in a narrative, and you need to apply the Mariner's 1-2-3 rule to determine the cone of avoidance. Now, let me show you all of that. Here's a forecast of a wind track uh, that's come over voice uh, radio or the nav text. And it says, tropical storm, winds of 34 knots, gale, extend out to 120 nautical miles from the center. Then it says, our initial prediction is that on the 8th, that is the, the date of 8, let's say that June 8th, at 0600, the storm center will be located at 30.0 north, 68.2 west, and the maximum winds are 40 knots. 12 hours later, at 1800, it's going to be at this location, 45 knots max. 24 hours from the initial forecast at 0600 on the 9th, it will be here. 48 hours, two days after the initial, it's forecast to be here. 72 hours, three days, it's forecast to be here. Now, recognize that these are forecasts. These are not actualities. So at that time when they gave this report, this is what they expected. But this may change. Uh, as, as time progresses and they gather more information. But you take this information, and in order to apply the Mariner's 1-2-3 rule, which will develop a cone of avoidance for you to avoid, um, the first thing you do is plot the positions. So here I've plotted the initial position, 12 hours, 24 hours, 48, 72 hours. So this is where the storm is predicted to be in those time periods. Now you recall that from this it said the gale force conditions extend out 120 miles from the center. So we'll take 120 miles and draw circles of 120 mile radius around these points. And I've drawn those in here. So these are the gale force wind circles with a radius of 120, 120 miles. The next step is to apply the Mariner's 1-2-3 rule, which basically is one day out, that is at 24 hours, you add 100 miles to the radius. Two days out, you add 200 miles. Three days out, you add 300 miles. And basically, that is to deal with the unpredictability of, of the hurricane track. So here's what you would do one day out. You would apply this, this radius, so it would be 120 miles plus 100, 200, 
220 mile radius at 24 hours from now. And two days from now, 48 hours, we would apply 120 plus 200, 320. And three days from now, you would apply that circle. 120 plus 300 is 420. So these blue circles establish the cone of avoidance that you, you would like to avoid if at all possible. And um, in order to uh, stay away from the uh, possible uh, track changes of the, of the storm. Because what they predict here on this date may not be the case when they get later information from now. But this is felt to be a conservative estimate of where the storm might be. And it's used in, in planning your route of avoidance. Um, so that's some of the theory. Let's look at some of the actual storm tracks. The first thing I'll do is summarize for you what's actually occurred in, in various years. And I, I took four different years selected to show you the, the Atlantic Basin. And you can see here that in this year, 1995, the storms range from early June to early November. Most of them developed off the coast of Africa, went west, and turned and traveled to the northeast. And this is typically what many of the storms will do. But you also notice that some of the storms developed, initiated outside of that area west of Africa. And uh, here's one that's developing just to the north of Cuba, went across Florida and inland. Here's a number of them that developed down along the Yucatan and into the Gulf and so forth. So that's the year 1995. Here's the year 2000. Again, many developed off coast of Africa, but again, many developed in other locations. Many of them turned and went to the northeast. Here's the year 2005. This is a little blurry, but uh, there's fewer developing off the coast of Africa. Many of them are developing here in the tropics um, and in the Caribbean and in the Gulf and going in a lot of random directions. Uh, but again, many of them turned and went to the northeast. And here's the year 2010. Again, many developed in the uh, west of Africa, turned and did that uh, nice turn to the northeast, but also many, many more developed in the Yucatan area. And um, you can see they went in various directions. So that's a little background as to uh, what you might expect. But one of the lessons you might draw from these diagrams is if you're going to sail in this area of the world, there's a good likelihood that you're going to have to deal with an encounter uh, with a, an encounter of a hurricane and um, in some form or another. And you remember I said that all the lights never stay green. It might be a nice, bright, sunny day, but four or five days later, you might be surprised at what, what occurs out there. So you not only have to be prepared with avoiding a storm, but you also have to be prepared with defending in case you are hit by the storm. And I'll show you some details on that as we proceed. So let's talk about our experience. And excuse me one second while I have a drink of water. <clears throat> I'm going to discuss five storms that we've encountered um, over the years. We've encountered more than this, but these are the ones that I've chosen to discuss because I think there's some lessons in these. The first one goes back to July 1995, Tropical Storm Barry. And at this time, we were at sea about one-fifth of the way from Norfolk to Bermuda when this Tropical Storm Barry sprang up ahead of us, and it offered a high probability of crossing our path. And here we are. Here's the east coast of the U.S. and Canada. Here's North, the red line shows the, our rum line, our track line from Norfolk to Bermuda. And this dotted line here shows the track that Barry actually took, Tropical Storm Barry. So on this date, July 6, 1995, here was our morning 
a weather forecast copied in one of our notebooks. And this says basically July 6, 95, WX referring to weather, voice forecast for November, Mike November, that's the Coast Guard's um, radio station in which they, they forecast this information. And this report was taken at 0600. And uh, it's broken down into various zones. Zone 1 is north of our area, but Zone 2 is the area that we're interested in. And the report comes from the weather, the weather office in Washington, D.C. And it said there's a high-pressure ridge along 39 north, and it's going to exist until Friday. But it also said there's a low developing at 32 north, 70 west, that's not far from us. It's 390 miles from our present location. And we took this information and other parts of that forecast, and we plotted on this piece of paper that we keep on board the various information that we elicited from that um, uh, forecast. And it showed, well, it shows, uh, this diagram shows our route to Bermuda, the straight line. That's our rum line. Here's our position. There's a red circle around it, our position. Here's a high-pressure ridge along 39 north. Here's a wind direction from the southeast at 15 knots, wind direction from the east at um, 20 knots. This dotted line is the um, continental shelf, roughly the 1,000 fathom curve. And in, inland of that, towards land, shoreward of that is uh, 10 knots of wind blowing from the east. And these little um, notations here, HC, um, BC, and so forth, are the um, way in which they break the forecast down into to different zones. So this HC stands for Hudson Canyon, BC Baltimore Canyon. HC Hatteras Canyon, BR Blake Ridge. Well, they no longer use Blake Ridge. They now use 31 North as their as their boundary for this. And here's the low that we saw in the forecast in this in this part of the forecast right here. So there's the low. There's our track, and there's us. Uh, that's on July 6th. On July 7th, the next day. Here's our track. Here's us at that point. Here's wind blowing from the southeast at uh, 15 knots. But this low has now intensified to 30 knots, and it's beginning to move to the northeast. And that's when we said, uh-oh, we look like we might have a problem because we don't know exactly where that storm is going to go and what it may do. So our strategy was to turn away from the forecast track of Barry to put some distance between us and the storm. Since we were on the left of Barry's track, we put the wind on our starboard quarter and sa sailed away at maximum speed. So let's look at that diagram. This Barry is moving in this direction. We're to the left of track. So we want to have the storm on our, on our starboard quarter. And remember this, uh, as we discussed before, Starboard quarter, we're sailing away from the storm, left of track, northern hemisphere. Um, this was our navigational plot at that time. And here was our rum line to Bermuda, this straight line. And at 0200 on the 7th, here was our location. And we continued sailing in this direction as we kept getting more weather reports. And you notice here we turned south. Uh, while we were thinking that that might avoid the storm. And then as, as our information became uh, more definite about what Barry was doing, we decided, okay, let's turn around and sail away from Barry. And here's where we put the wind on our starboard quarter and sailed away from Barry in this direction. So you see we were sailing this way towards Bermuda. We then turned and went back. And this was at 2400 on the 7th. And then Sometime after that, the, um, the storm um, very, very clearly clarified the direction that it was going and uh, passed our rum line. And by the 0900 on the 8th, we had turned around and we're heading back on our route. So this was our storm avoidance maneuver. 
here was um, the eighth and our weather plot. And you see Barry is now blowing 60 knots out to this distance from the storm center. Here's us at that point, And we had successfully um, avoided that storm. Uh, and also had provided additional distance in the event that that storm decided to change track from what was forecast. So uh, the bottom line, after about 10 hours of back backtracking, we resumed our desired course to Bermuda. Barry had passed our rum line and gave clear indications of making a dash to the northeast. And frequently, once one of these hurricanes begins this dash to the northeast, it moves very rapidly. And once it does that, it's very, very rare that it's going to change course. Um, doesn't say that it might not change course, but um, usually they don't. So that was our first uh, experience that I wanted to talk about. Here's a second one, Hurricane Olga, November, December 2001. And in this case, we're at sea two-thirds of the way from Norfolk to St. Thomas when Hurricane Olga sprang up 900 miles to our northeast, and it was forecast to move toward us. And here, this shows a diagram. The red is our track, and here's where we were on the 20th. Here's us on the 25th and the 30th. And the green circle here is Bermuda. And down here is St. Thomas, which is where we were going. Up here was Norfolk, where we left. Well, the storm sprang up on the 24th, um, and here we were on the 25th. And the forecast was it for, for it to travel west. And you can see from this track, the final track of the storm, here's what it eventually did. And this was us on the 25th. And here is a storm on the 25th. And here's Bermuda right here. So um, we said, OK, what, what are we going to do? Well, let's look at the logbook at that point. And um, this again, on the 25th at 1100, November, Mike, November, the voice forecast, uh, the low was located here. It was moving west at 10 knots. And it's supposed to stall to the east of Bermuda. It was a very unpredictable storm. At this time, we were about halfway between Bermuda and St. Thomas. Here's Bermuda, here's St. Thomas, and here's we are. We're in the middle of the ocean. There is no place to go. There's no place to hide. There's no port of refuge to go to. And this storm is forecast to come in our direction. Um, here was a weather plot. This is off our weather facts on board. And here was Olga, right here at that time. And here we were, this red dot here. And um, so we had this big lurking storm behind us. And our decision was to make all rapid speed that we can towards St. Thomas, because there is no other place to go. What's the likelihood that that storm might turn south and head to St. Thomas? Well, we felt that that was probably unlikely. And certainly, we didn't want to head north since it's forecast to go west. The storm is forecast to go west. So our decision was uh, to keep sailing, to go as rapidly as we can towards our destination in St. Thomas. Uh, here was our navigational plot when we made the turn south on that date, on the 25th. So our strategy, being more than halfway to St. Thomas when this developed and predicted to move towards us, since Atlantic hurricanes will usually move west, then recurve to the northeast, we opted to make all speed to our destination. But this was somewhat complicated since Olga's southwest winds now let's go back to this. The winds are blowing for our location from the southwest. Okay, So what those southwesterly winds were doing from Olga was canceling out the easterly trade winds, um, which would have helped us go 
more quickly toward St. Thomas. In other words, at this point, without the hurricane being here, we would normally have easterlies blowing, strong easterlies blowing uh, the trade winds. We would be on a reach, and they call that inter Interstate 65 because you're on Longitude 65 heading south with the winds blowing from the east on a nice beam reach. And if they're blowing 20 knots from the east, uh, you might be making eight or nine knots through the water. Um, but what happened is, since Olga was up here, Olga's winds were blowing from the west or southwest and canceling out the um, easterly trade winds. So we did not have that easterly trade wind. So that complicated our, our strategy um, in making rapid speed, but we did make speed. We had to use the, use the engine quite a bit during that time. But we arrived in St. Thomas on November 30th, at which time Olga was still wandering around and um, finally uh, dissipated December 7th over Cuba. Um, also, Olga was producing a large swell traveling towards St. Thomas, traveling towards the Caribbean. The Caribbean weather stations told of large and dangerous breaking waves on the north side of the islands, which would be problems possibly in um, entering through some of the passages. So we opted to enter the Caribbean through the Savannah Passage on the west end of St. Thomas. It's a wide passage and it was manageable. So here was our approach to St. Thomas at that point. Here's St. Thomas in the distance on November 29th. And here's St. Thomas in this chart and the Savannah Passage is wide. We went through it and we had no problems with the breaking waves. We turned east and went into our port there at the Charlotte Amelie. So uh, the bottom line, Holga threatened us for five days, screwed up our trade winds and produced large breaking waves at our destination, but we dodged the bullet and successfully avoided her 90 knot winds. And here was our happy crew. And uh, let's see, two, two of these gentlemen are, are at the meeting here today, Mike McGovern um, and uh, Billy Simmons. So these two gents uh, sailed that cruise with me. Here's our third um, storm that I'd like to talk about. And this is Tropical Storm Sean in November of 2011. And this, this cruise of ours was uh, skippered by Captain Jack Morton. And on November 4th, we were in port preparing to depart for St. Thomas from Norfolk when this intense load developed off Hatteras producing storm force winds on our intended route. We delayed departure and departed Norfolk on the 7th when the low moved out to sea. But on November 8th, the low intensified to Tropical Storm Sean 500 miles ahead of our position and began moving toward us after we were, had committed and were at sea. So here's a diagram showing this. There, this red line was our um, intended run line at that point. Here we were, um, and here is the storm track as it, as it ended up developing. Well, let me show you some of this. As I mentioned, uh, November 4th, our planned departure day, this uh, low developed with storm force winds of 50 plus knots off of Hatteras. November 7th, the low moved out to sea, leaving 30 knot northeast winds. We departed Norfolk with plans to proceed south and remain west of the Gulf Stream until the low clarified what its intentions were. November 8th, the low intensified to, to Tropical Storm Sean, moved west. We were approaching Hatteras and the Gulf Stream and made the decision to round Hatteras and seek harbor of refuge at Beaufort, North Carolina. November 9th, we entered Beaufort. November 11th, Tropical Storm Sean moved northeast and we departed Beaufort. Let's look at some charts. Here is November 4th. We're in port at Norfolk at this time. We were supposed to depart, and we didn't. Here's Norfolk, where this red dot is. Here's the storm 
as it developed on that date. And this note here says developing storm, storm force winds, and here developing gale force winds. So storm force means over 48 knots, gale force over 34 knots. So that's when we said we're going to delay for a few days. November 5th, still in Port Norfolk. Here's Norfolk. The low moved out to sea, but we had still storm force winds here along along the coast, actually for several hundred miles out to sea. That means well in well above 48 knots of uh, wind strength. And the move is uh, the storm is moving southeast and predicted to go to this location in the next 48, 24, 12 hours, actually. And November 6th, in Port Norfolk still, the storm had moved to this location. Here's Bermuda right here. And we're still waiting. But we're saying, look, it's looking better and better. There's gale force winds here between us and the storm. But these isobars are spreading out, and um, the, it ought to start moderating. November 7th, we departed Norfolk. And here was the low again, southwest of Bermuda. Now, naturally, once we departed and committed ourselves, the storm decided to turn around and head back towards us. So here it is now intensified to Tropical Storm Sean. It's now moving per this arrow to the northwest towards our location. And here we were at that time. This is November 8th. Here's November 8th. And uh, we were on this rum line. And here was our location at the time when we realized it was heading back towards us. We made the decision to abort and go into Beaufort, North Carolina, which is what we did. This green arrow represents the Gulf Stream. And um, we certainly don't want to be caught in the Gulf Stream with storm force northeasterly is blowing in the opposite direction. So we went into Beaufort. And on the 9th is when we entered Beaufort. The storm now is traveling north-northwest still towards our direction, and we hunkered down for two days, and here we are in the 10th. The storm now started to recurve and go to the northeast. We're still in Beaufort, and on the 11th we departed, and the storm is now clearly heading to the northeast. So we departed Beaufort on the 11th. So that was our experience on that date on that particular storm where we actually did a, an abort and a, um, a sort of harbor of, refuge, harbor of refuge. This is not something that we often do because to seek a harbor of refuge, you're going to be near land. And one of the worst places to be uh, in a storm is near land. Um, you'd prefer to be out to sea, but we, we felt we had enough time to do this and go into Beaufort uh, before the storm intensified in our area if it was going to. So this is when we departed, November 11th. And here was our happy crew, and here's Captain Jack Morton, uh, who skippered that crew, and uh, these guys felt very, very good about having avoided that storm. The rest of the trip down to St. Thomas was uh, uneventful, a pleasant trip. Our next storm, Tropical Storm Beryl, May 2012. On Friday, May 25th, NOAA located a tropical storm in the Atlantic about 150 miles south of Cape Hatteras. They forecast it to move southwest of Florida, then do an abrupt 180 degree turn and race northeast along the U.S. East Coast, reaching Hatteras by Wednesday, May 30th. We were scheduled to leave Norfolk on Monday, May 28th, bound for Bermuda, requiring that we cross tracks with the storm. So May 28th, the 25th, the storm developed. Here's a diagram of that. Here's a storm 
um, on that date, on May 25th. It's located here. And we are in Norfolk. The storm is forecast to go southwest uh, inland and then do a, a 180 degree turn and travel up along the coast. So we're in, in port on the 25th. And here was the forecast. Our challenge, do we believe the forecast? Do we believe that this storm is going to actually turn around and go this way? Or do we say, ah, I don't believe that? Um, this forecast could be an error in at least four ways. Chances of an abrupt turn to the northeast, question mark. Will it be on the track predicted or off the track? Will the speed of advance be faster or slower than predicted? And will the wind speed be increasing or decreasing? If we go early, we could be in the middle of a hurricane by Wednesday. If we delay four days, half the crew will need to bail out. So we made the decision to depart for sea a day early, Sunday, May 27, and cross the cone of avoidance ahead of the storm. So this is one of those calculated risks that we made. We said we're going to believe the forecast. We're going to believe the timing of the forecast. Um, but if worse comes to worse, we could be in the middle of a thick soup by Wednesday. We'll make max speed south to increase our distance past the forecast storm track. So here were some trade-offs that we had to consider. This puts us past the Gulf Stream and away from the area where storm force winds could be blowing against the current. So that was, a, that was one of our biggest considerations, the fact that we did not want to be in the Gulf Stream when the storm came to that area because uh, gale force or storm force winds against the Gulf Stream are going to produce waves of 20 to 25 feet which we would like to avoid. But it also put us on the right side of the storm's track where we can expect stronger winds than on the left side. So we said, okay, we're going we're to accept that risk. If the storm is on schedule by Wednesday, we could heave to for eight hours before the storm hits and complete storm preps for boat and crew for, per the Maryland School's Blue Book Guide. Well, here's the forecast two days later on May 27th. We departed for sea on the 27th, a day early. At that time, the storm was here in southern Georgia. Here it is, 11 p.m. on Monday in southern Georgia. Here's the forecast for it. The D is signified depression. The S signifies a storm storm force that is over 48 knots. Here is Sunday the 27th we departed Norfolk and here we were Monday. Um, here was a storm on Monday. Okay so our objective was to get across that Gulf Stream get south before the storm got to where we are and this is the track they forecast. So we sailed in that direction put as much distance as we could between us and the storm, a storm track. And we did preps at sea on Wednesday. And this is one of two pages showing this. So the, the preps that we did is we pre-rigged the sea anchor in case we had to deploy it. And the sea anchor is a storm um, uh, survival um, piece of equipment that puts you basically uh, on a large parachute that's below the water, um, holding the bow of your boat up into the wind. And it's a way of riding out a storm hove too, if worse gets to worse. So we pre-rigged that to be ready. We secured the roller furling Genoa and stay sail with extra wraps of sheets and added a lashing to furling drums to make sure we didn't accidentally unfurl those furling sails. We double secured our furling lines themselves. We raise a storm trysail, which is a storm mainsail, on its dedicated track. 
we furled the mainsail and added a lashing through the through the clue and around the mast. This is a roller furling main. So we rolled it all the way in, put an extra lashing around the mast through the clue of the sail, and we're riding now on the storm trysail as, as our mainsail. We erected a boom crutch to stabilize the boom. We added extra lashings to the ground anchors on the bow pulpit so they didn't jump off uh, in rough weather. Uh, we removed the bimini canvas and lashed the frame to the backstays. We double-checked all gear, including dinghy lashings on the stern arch. We made PBJ sandwiches and stowed in Ziploc baggies. Um, crew members took seasickness medications. Crew members located and stowed their personal gear in ready locations, because usually when you're trying to find your flashlight in the dark, and you don't remember where you put it. It's awful. We contacted the Coast Guard via single sideband radio to advise them of our position on the potential track of the storm. They asked us a lot of questions about our equipment, our crew, and so forth. And um, they asked us to uh, report into them uh, on a certain time schedule. And also, each crew member verified certain storm prep equipment checklists that are listed in the Maryland School's um, Blue Book, our Ocean Training Crews Prep Guide. There's a whole series of checklists, equipment checklists that they went through. So we were ready. And here, here's what actually happened. So here is 5 p.m. Wednesday. The storm is actually here. It was very close to where they predicted. Here we were on Wednesday. This is where we did the storm preps. And here's what the storm actually ended up doing. Here it was 2 p.m. on Thursday. Here we were Thursday. Here was a storm Thursday. We were outside of the Gulf Stream, outside of the, the cone of avoidance, outside of the storm track. The worst we got was 35 knots. So Barrel passed 250 miles north of us on Wednesday night, overnight. It was right on the predicted track and timing. It did not have to be. The winds near the center were 50 knots. Winds at our location were 35 knots. We were well prepared and came through it unscathed. We derigged our storm preps and continued sailing to Bermuda. And NOAA's forecasts are getting better in recent years. We placed a lot of reliance on the forecast, and they were right. And we were escorted by dolphins. These, is, these were our accomplices on this, uh, on this mission. Uh, and here's our happy crew. So that was another one of our experiences. And for the next one, a Hatteras Low, November 2012, on November 2nd, again, we're in Norfolk, preparing to get underway by November 4th, bound for St. Thomas. This, again, was Captain Jack Morton, skipper in this trip. An intense low was forecast to develop off South Carolina November 6th and move northeast along the Gulf Stream past Hatteras and intensify to hurricane force by November 7th. So this is the forecast. We're scheduled to leave on the 4th. November 6th and 7th don't look too good. So here was the November 3rd forecast for November 6th. So, so on the 3rd, they said, here's what you can expect on the 6th. So Captain Jack and I agreed that the thing to do is depart early. We did that. We departed um, uh, a day early. And we said, again, we want to get past this potential storm track uh, before it develops. Here was the area where the storm was developing um, on the 6th. On the 3rd, this didn't exist, this intensity here. It was a beautiful sunny day. We departed and head, headed out on our track. But the third forecast for the 6th showed this low developing. Then the third forecast for the 7th was this, that we would have hurricane force winds here as that low moved 
northeast. And this purple area, you see 60 knots in here, developing off of Hatteras and blowing from the north, northwest. So what we did is um, duck out ahead of that before this actually developed. Um, we had these options on the third. Number one, stay in port and wait five days for the load to move away from the area. Or two, depart November 3rd, one day ahead of schedule, and get south and past the Gulf Stream before the storm develops. We elected option two and left at 1600 on the third, avoiding the storm, and it was smooth sailing from there on. We actually got in under the storm, and here was our location on November 7th. Here was a storm on November. See, here's the forecast for the 7th. Here's what the storm actually did, very close to the earlier forecast. Here we were on the 7th in uh, 25 to 30 knot westerlies, making great time towards St. Thomas. And the rest of that trip had um, very boisterous winds, but very manageable. And Cap Jack did a wonderful job in maneuvering the boat on that, um, on that cruise. And here they are again, another happy crew. Here's Captain Jack up here, and here's our happy crew at sea. So in summary, here are the five storms. Barry, we maneuvered to avoid, that is, we reverse course. Olga, we maintain our course to avoid, uh, since we had no place else to go. Uh, Tropical Storm Sean, we sought a port of refuge in, in Beaufort. Tropical storm barrel, we departed early. Storm preps at sea in case we were hit. The Hatteras low, we departed early and got in under that. So these were five different approaches that we used because there were five different conditions that we were dealing with. Um, so the lessons learned, what are some of the things that we've learned from this? Well, number one, technical. You must understand the basics of weather patterns and um, why they move in certain directions, how they intensify, and so forth. And what are the uh, characteristics of a low pressure system? What are the characteristics of a cold front, a high pressure system that's coming through? You must understand these basics so that when things are occurring at sea, uh, you can analyze the occurrences based on your understanding of the characteristics of different uh, weather systems, low pressure systems, cold fronts, and high pressure. You, number two, you have to have a grasp on the probabilities. What's the likelihood that that storm is going to turn and head northeast? What's the likelihood that it's going to um, uh, stall or go west. Understand local conditions. What are the things that happen when a storm approaches the Gulf Stream, for example? What are the conditions that occur when a, when a storm crosses land and then comes out to sea? What are the conditions when a, a storm is only uh, uh, at the depression level and it comes out to sea and it intensifies? How does that occur? You want to have alternative options. That is, here's my plan, here's where I'm heading, there's the storm. If all turns to the worst, what would I do? In the case of Beryl, a couple of years ago when we did the preps at sea, we said, okay, our alternative option in that case is to be able to prep the, the boat and the crew for storm conditions at sea if we are hit. In the case of um, the storm where we aborted to uh, Beaufort, we had an option there. When we originally left Norfolk, we said uh, we'll stay west of the Gulf Stream and abort to Beaufort if we have to, and we did have to. Uh, prepare for the worst. We did our preps at sea in case the worst occurred. So know what those conditions are and know what your options are and be, be ready with the preparations. 
Um, weather data. You have to have weather data as time progresses here from 1995. All we had was um, uh, VHF, voice single sideband, and nav text. And now, of course, we have email and weather faxes and satellite text images and so forth. Um, have this equipment. Get the, get the um, information on board so that you can analyze it and uh, make decisions with the latest information. Um, Shore-based advisor. Uh, what we do is we always use uh, one of our captains um, ashore um, who is uh, viewing the extensive information that's available on the internet with wind forecasts, storm forecasts, and then can provide advisory guidance to our boat at sea via email. And we use this all always on our um, ocean trips. But the point of it is um, that that advisor ought to have some pretty extensive uh, experience sailing in that ocean of the world. So you can either use someone you know who is uh, experienced giving you advice or a paid advisory service. But be certain that the advisory service has considerable ocean sailing experience in the area that you are sailing in because each area of the world is different. So um, uh, there are many times when the paid advisory can be a weather expert and a radio expert, but may not be quite as expert with um, sailing at sea in that area of the world. So be, be selective in your choice there. Um, here are some of my favorite internet weather so sources, and um, you won't be able to read all these now, but they are in the handout that we passed on to you. So um, you can utilize these um, when you're going on the internet to uh, view some of the weather, weather information available.